St. John's Cathedral, and we're so blessed to have you here today and to have Jan Karen with us. What an exciting afternoon. This cathedral was built in 1834, uh, was burned to the ground in the, in the Civil War, rebuilt, and then burned to the ground again in 1901. So we are tough, aren't we? And uh, many of you may not know, we actually sit on the highest point in Jacksonville. It's called Billy Goat Hill. Uh, this uh, building was finished in 1906. And uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a jewel of a building, and we're so blessed uh, to have you here with us today. Jan is the second speaker in a new speaker series that has been uh, offered here at the cathedral. This is a speaker series in honor of the Right Reverend Frank Servany, who was Bishop of Florida for 18 years. Frank was an incredible preacher and pastor and was so well loved that we had to do something to honor him. Uh, Frank, would you stand up so people can see you? <laughs> So we hope that you all will find an envelope in your pews for the Servany Speaker Series and make a donation so that we can continue to bring these incredible speakers to this place and to honor that wonderful man. And now to introduce Jan Karen, New York Times bestselling author of 14 books, Mitford novels plus other Mitford books. Uh, Jan has been a writer since the age of 10 when she won a high school writing contest. And before Jan became an author, she had a very successful career in advertising, but this desire to be an author never left her. So at age 50, she left advertising, how brave, moved to Bowling Rock, and began writing her Mitford stories as installments in the local paper which became the first Mitford book. How yeah. wonderful that you began that way. Just That's... like Mr. Dickens. <laughs> Just like Mr. Dickens. So Jan and I are going to have a conversation, uh, but I want to give you all some uh, direction about how this is going to proceed. After my conversation with Jan, we will take questions from you all, the audience, okay? Note cards are in your pews. So as we're talking, if you get a great question that pops into your head, feel free to write it down. Please try to write legibly, because I've got to read your question. Ushers will collect the cards from the pews, and then we'll have the Q&A. After the Q&A, Jan is a very generous author. She really wants to look her fans in the eye. And so fans are welcome to stay for a meet and greet after the Q&A. Um, fans using walkers or wheelchairs will get in line first, okay? So let's let those come in line first, and then the ushers will direct each row um, to form a single line so that you can actually walk up to Jan and, and speak to her for a moment. Um, you're welcome to take pictures of Jan while you're waiting in line, but um, to keep the line moving, it's better to do that than to take a bunch of pictures when you actually get to her, okay? No selfies, please. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> um, Jan does want to meet all of her fans today, so she will not be signing books during the meet and greet. Uh, your, our bookstore has pre-signed copies of Jan's book. She was here signing all morning for you, and those are available today for purchase in two locations, the foyer, which is outside of Tolliver Hall, and also in Ingram Lounge. And following this Q&A, we hope that you will come and enjoy some tea, which is provided for, by the Daughters of the King, our prayer order here at the cathedral, and to enjoy one another's company. Does that sound good? Great. Great. Okay. Jan. Unlike many bestsellers today, you've said that your books have no cussing, no murder, and no mayhem. <laughs> Given the state of popular culture, what makes your books so popular, and why do you think they speak so strongly to your devoted readers? 
Well, you know, there's also no sex in my books, which really, um, I thought I would have a very small vein of readers because people have said, well, what do you write about? No murder, no sex, no, I mean, what is there? Well, there's a lot. And um, if I can't write to make someone happy, I don't really want to write. I say, what's the use of doing it? It's a very difficult thing to write a novel. Mm. I want to make you laugh and cry, and especially I would like you to feel safe. One of the things I love about the priesthood is that a priest must wear a collar. I like that because it's meant to say, here is a safe place to run. I like my books to be a safe place for you. People have said, I just love your books. They put me to sleep at night. <laughs> I said, well, thank you so much. That means a lot. <laughs> Did I answer your question? So, yes. So they're providing a kind of comfort, would you say? Yes. And that's something that people are searching for. In this well, we're searching anxiety yes, for age. comfort, for community. Mm. I think we all long for community. I see a, a dear friend of mine uh, in the congregation today. I used to be in advertising with him years ago. Uh, it was a wonderful field that taught me a lot about fiction. Take that as you will. <laughs> oh boy, that's <laughs> profound. Although I did try to write very truly because I've always respected the reader. I respected the reader of whatever product I was trying to sell. I respect the reader who will pick up one of my books and want to take the time to read it. Um, did I answer you? You did, you did, excellent. excellent. I sort of take rabbit legs, or dog legs, or <laughs> rabbit chases, or whatever. <laughs> Tell me about the gift of storytelling. Do you feel that that's something that you were just born with, or is it a craft that you had to develop and to learn? I know I, for one, would love to write a novel, but I don't think I have that capacity. Do you feel that it was just a gift that poured into you from God, or do you feel that it was like a house that you had to build from the beginning? Both of those things Both. are completely accurate. Interesting. At the age of 10, I knew that I was going to be a writer. I wanted more than anything to do what had given me so much joy. When I read a book that transported this little country girl out of the woods into some other, other place, that was a gift, and I wanted to be able to give that to people. Um, and so... I, I really do feel that I was born to write, but I've had to cultivate the craft of it. You see, the craft, I don't think, is necessarily a gift. It may be, but I think that's something you've got to hone. It's like an ax. You know, you've got to sharpen and sharpen both sides so nicely so it cuts and focuses. Mm. So I think the gift itself is from God. Uh, but the, the craft, the honing, is really quite up to us with his help. With his help. Wow, that's very profound. Tell us about faith in your stories. I love how you, you bring Christianity into the very fabric of your stories, but it doesn't overpower. It's not meant to... Uh, proselytize or hit people over the head. How do you incorporate Christianity into your work without making it feel didactic? How is it that you do that? Well, I think Christianity isn't didact didactic. I think it's how we present it that makes it unattractive or unpalatable. And so we must be very careful to introduce laughter and tenderness of heart into the stories of our faith because God loves us to laugh. I'm sure of that. I don't remember if it's scripture, but I do think he loves us to laugh. He gave us this wonderful world. He gave us these beautiful windows. We're to enjoy. We're to have pleasure. We're to laugh. We're to have fun. So, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You also manage to take people into the most beautiful, messy parts of church. You're actually able to show them church, and church is difficult to explain. Mm -hmm. um, how did you manage to do that? And did you have a past experience with church that brought that to life for you? I'm not sure that I did. Uh, I'm not sure that, that any of my writing came from any specific kind of church life. 
but since I was a child in the Methodist Church, I've always loved what I shall call just the life of the church, what it meant, the singing. You know, I'd love to look around at all the faces and see how people enjoyed the hymns. I heard a sermon the other day, and I have to say it was not very good, but the hymns preached <laughs> what we needed to hear. <laughs> the hymns were so gorgeous. So we come to church and we sing and there's music and there's beautiful color. And so often, especially I think in the Episcopal church, we have gorgeous architecture. So there's beauty all around us, which makes us happy. Um, I think that my writings about church just come from putting all of those life experiences into a barrel of grapes, and then you jump in barefoot and start crushing the grapes. Mm. You don't know where that grape came from anymore, or that grape, but you have wine suddenly, mm. made from all those composites. Mm. That's where my characters come from, the same place. You just sort of throw it all into a barrel and squash it, and, <laughs> and these individual characters start coming to life. Mm. You're like Jesus turning water into wine when you write. Yeah. Well, you know, um, Francis Collins uh, wrote a book called The Language of God, and he talks about God writing us into being, using our genome, oh, writing us into oh, existence. Yes. And I, I think about that, Jen. You write these characters into existence, and they really are sort of alive. I mean, I love some of these people. I love Dooley. I love Father Tim. You know, how do you, how do you breathe that life into them? Is can you explain that or give us a hint as to how that happens? Do they come to you in the night? Do all they, of the above. All of the above? <laughs> I really think that I'm a great part of all of those characters, or I should say those characters are a great part of me. I love Miss Rose, for example, mm -hmm. and the way she dressed. She got to wear that smashed cocktail hat and her <laughs> brother's uh, uniform out to direct traffic. I mean, I would actually like to do that if only one time, but I can't, so <laughs> here's Miss Rose. And Uncle Billy, dear Uncle Billy, now deceased, mm -hmm. I loved his clean jokes. Do you know how hard it is to find clean jokes on the <laughs> internet? And so every time there was a major event in Mitford, Uncle Billy would prepare and rehearse in front of the mirror this joke he was going to tell. Should I tell you one? I hope it's okay to tell this in the cathedral. I'm sure. I'll tell it like Uncle Billy told it. Oh, good. <clears throat> well, there's this feller going around, don't you know, uh, taking the census. And he come to this house, and he knocks on the door, and a woman comes to the door, and he says, how many young'uns you got, and what are their ages? She said, well, let's see. We've got Willie and Billy, they're 14, and we've got Harry and Barry, they're, let's see, they're 12, and we got Penny and Jenny, they're nine, I think, going on 10. He says, hold on. Do you mean you got twins every time? She says, Law, no, there's hundreds of times we didn't get nothing. <laughs> I just love a clean joke. They just, they're so charming. Uncle Billy was so charming to me. I hated it when he died. And people say, well, you're the author. Why did you let him die? <laughs> well, it was just his time. You know, it was just his time. Mm -hmm. Miss Sadie, the same thing. Miss Sadie was one of my favorite mm -hmm. characters. I grieved. I grieved this fictional character. And then when Buck Leeper walked in, in book two, A Light in the Window, cussing like a sailor, smoking like a stack, and drinking like a sailor, I thought, what am I going to do with this man? He can't come into my book. <laughs> but I thought, let him stay. See what happens. Let's do this. Lord, mm -hmm. help me do this. Help me keep this character. I liked him. <clears throat> he was such a mess, I found myself praying for him one night. <laughs> I was working too hard at that time, I must say. <laughs> but my characters are so real to me. There is... They're just so real. I love each one of my characters. I even love Edith Mallory. Remember her? A whole ceiling had to fall down on her to get her to wake up to what was good and real in life. Uh, but in any case, I'm sort of 
Mm. Another dog leg, you know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so do you wake up in the morning, have a cup of coffee, and sit in silence and let these characters speak to you? How does this happen, this creative process? Well, for me, I just have to go sit down at the keyboard and uh, wait. Sometimes mm. I have nothing to say. I don't want to write. I feel very petulant. I just don't want to write today. I'm just tired of writing. Well, this book is no good anyway. Why should I spend my time doing this? And I sit down, and I start. I prepare myself. I pray. <sighs> and it starts to come. It just flows. It starts to flow. My dear friend Donna Ernest in the front row next to the Servanes is a painter, and I know you understand that. Sometimes you have to wait. It's worth waiting for. Hmm. You don't have to sit down with something to say. Don't press yourself. If you sit down, you'll get something to say. Hmm. Beautiful. Just wait. Just wait. Mm. Like how Christ waited to be resurrected, you know? We sometimes mm -hmm. just have to wait. Mm. I love that. But the pieces, not only the characters, are endearing and magnificent, but everything seems to come together to create this believable small town that we all want to live in. How do you pull people in and make them want to stay there? Other than Mitford, What's your favorite small town in literature? Was it something that you tasted before that got you to come up with this endearing? It, it's everything together. Somehow you bring it all together into this marvelous, enticing little place. Oh, thank you. I like to think that it's a universal small town. And I hear from people all over the world. I got a letter not long ago from South Africa, and my work reminds this person so much of where they live in South Africa. Hmm. Um, I've heard from China and India and wow. Utah and Omaha and all <laughs> over. And it's, they feel that I'm talking about the place where they live. So I just try to develop decent people. Uh, all of my friends read a book that had been on the New York Times list and still is for many, many, many weeks. I just couldn't read it. I tried, but I didn't like the main character. I didn't want to spend three, four, five days with this person, hmm. so I just quit. I create people whom I enjoy. If I'm, if I'm going to live with these people, and in this case, 20 years I've been writing about Mitford. Wow. I want to enjoy my time with the people I'm hanging out with. And I want to find out what, like, what made Edith Mallory tick? What made Buck Leaper tick? What made my heart go out to both of these broken people? So if I don't like it, I'm not going to write it. It's a good philosophy. Do you have a favorite town, a favorite place? You know, I really don't. Everywhere I go is my favorite place. Right now, Jacksonville oh. is my favorite place. <laughs> oh, stars. I love it. And Jacksonville is simply composed of many small towns, mm -hmm. neighborhoods, just, you know, all these components that make a big town with all those freeways and all of that. Uh, so... I just think Mitford is everywhere. People say they want to go live in Mitford. Is Mitford real? And I say it is absolutely real. You carry it with you. The friends I have down here are Mitford to me. It's a close, loving community. Bishop Servany, Lady Servany, and all their many dear and darling, wonderful friends, close-knit for many, many years. I feel like I'm just bathed in some confection when I'm here. So mm. community is everywhere if we go seeking it and believing in it. Believe that it's there. Believe that it's in your town. I don't mean to sound corny. I'm not trying to write bumper stickers and magnets to put on your refrigerator. <laughs> it's just you've got it. Mitford is here. It's with us now. So do you believe that the human being is fundamentally good? I do. And you believe that we could somehow find that kind of community that exists in Mitford if we were to, to work for it and hope for it? I think that we, yes. I think the real Mitford, of course, is heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the real Mitford. Um, 
But yes, we can, we can have, um, we can stand at the gate of heaven on occasion in the way we communicate with each other in the communities we form. Mm. We can kiss it once in a while, which sometimes can be enough. Mm. And what is it that you feel prevents people from achieving that kind of community? Oh, I don't know. For me, I would say feeling you're going to make a mistake, feeling you're going to appear stupid in front of other people so you don't speak up, you don't express who you really are. Mm -hmm. You sort of hide in some way. Yeah. I'm a sort of a hidden person, actually. I'm shy. So how I come out here, believe me, and do this, I just do not know. It's by the grace of God. It must be. And I love to speak to people. I love to see your faces. I love seeing your face, each individual lovely face. I'm so glad you're here. Somebody said to me, I said, well, how's the crowd out there, you know? I said, well, God will bring who he wants to be here. So mm -hmm. there you are. There and they it's are. wonderful. Here they are. Hmm. For you, what has been the most fulfilling part of writing this series? What, what was the most fulfilling part? I think learning how to let go when you sit down to whatever it is you have before you. If it's writing, baking, cleaning the house, painting, composing an opera, let go, just, just be unafraid mm. to let the Holy Spirit work through you and in you. And, you know, if you start a novel, it doesn't have to be, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, <laughs> or I had a farm in Africa. You just sit down and start. And later, when you come back to it, if it's not the perfect beginning, then you'll know how to make it perfect. I think to lose fear in the creative things we do is very, very important. And our creative gifts are so precious. They're given to us. And we need to, God, you know, like if somebody gives you, let's say that somebody gives you a painting. When they come to see you, you definitely want it on your wall. Mm -hmm. You know, you want, to, sure. you want them to see that you're enjoying right. it. <laughs> God would like us, I think, to, to, to show him how much enjoyment we have in this life and in the work that he gave us mm. to do. Yes, if we're given a gift, God wants us to use it and let go of the ramifications or mm. the fear, the shame. Mm. Yeah, I agree. W what's been the hardest part of what's, writing this series? What's the hardest part for you? I think maybe the hardest part is that I felt, and rightly so, that every book should be better than the last book, or at least equal to. My great fear was always that of, oh, well, you know, she wrote a good book the first time, but oh, did you see, don't even bother to buy it, the second one, or whatever. Series can often go like that. You have a huge challenge mm -hmm. uh, to make, to, to keep the stair steps going. So that was the hardest thing for me to do. And I'm, you know, I'm glad that I've written the final Mitford novel. I really had nothing left to say about them. I've given you everything my heart held uh, about Mitford. And I would hope that since everyone in this room is gifted with an enormous imagination, that you, you know, they say, well, are Dooley and Lace going to have a boy or a girl? I say, you, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> Use your imagination to let this flower continue to bloom if you love Mitford and that will be that'll be good mm -hmm. and then later if we see each other tell me how you've been mm -hmm. thinking about what happens next I, I do believe that it will take a life of its own it really will out of all the characters and you've mentioned some wonderful ones which, which one has surprised you the most that's in their a great development? question yeah which character has surprised me the most Mm, Dooley was pretty surprising. Look what a wonderful young man he has become yeah, so and always was. I mean, obviously the seed had to be there or he couldn't have become what he mm. is, but he had a good teacher. 
Father Tim really sacrificed a lot to help raise this boy. Um, I think uh, I loved fleshing out Miss Sadie and her long love story. Uh, this woman over here going, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's read probably three or four times through the whole series. <laughs> um, it, but it's so interesting that so many of my wonderful fans have read the series more than once, just for fun. Mm. Who has read the series more than once? Well, Thank that's you. A, that's a lot. That's terrific. Who's never read the series? Oh, come on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> The photographer. <laughs> She's so busy being visual. <laughs> That's always interesting to, to see to whom I'm speaking. But I love my characters, as I said before, and I think they're all rich. Buck Leaper was a rich character for me. Maybe Buck Leaper surprised me the most. I really didn't know what he was going to become. I had no idea. Hmm. He was on his way to Mississippi, still a broken man. And he turned around and came back. He mm. drove a long way to come back to pray with Father Tim. That's pretty special. Yeah. Tell us about the very beginning of this process of the Mitford series. So you, you're in advertising, you turn 50, and what's the catalyst that, that causes you to have the courage to drop a lifelong career and and become this writer, and, and not only that, but why Mitford? What, what's the catalyst for creating Mitford? I think because advertising was, for me, a pretty brutal profession. Uh, Jerry Torsh is in the audience. I don't know whether you would agree with that, Jerry. Jerry was a pretty famous art director, I must say. But it was, it was every day. What have you done for me today? I mean, it was very pressure-laden. I wanted to go to a quiet place. Mm. I just wanted to get my head and my heart and my soul quiet. I've been a Christian for about 12 years or 14 at that time. And I knew God had called me at the age of 10 to be a writer. So it's, I'm thinking, if I don't do this now, when am I going to do this? Yeah, yeah. Never, maybe never. Mm. So here's what I set for myself. I'm going to have a two-year plan. I'm going to pray in a very focused way. I'm going to just focus on that one thing of leaving advertising, having the courage, I was scared to death, the courage to go out and see what would happen. And I kept a journal. A journal is a very helpful tool, as many of you may know. And after two years, I got the green light and I went. And um, what was your question? <laughs> the catalyst for, for beginning, but then also how did the, Mitford, what was the germ that created Mitford? Well, maybe because I wanted a quiet place mm -hmm. and maybe because I moved to a quiet place, Blowing Rock, North Carolina, I'm sure some of you know it. You go there to get cool in the summer. It was a lovely little town. I had grown up in Lenore, North Carolina, which was also a small town. I grew up with small town values and convictions. Mm. So it seemed, and also, I had been reading Miss Reed. Has anyone in here ever read Miss Reed? Yes. She's really little known in America. A lovely British author, now deceased. She wrote about, a, about village life. Oh. I began to see by paying attention just how much goes on in a small, simple village and how it's really not that simple at all. I would go and hang out with the merchants in Blowing Rock. You know, we didn't have to talk about anything important. I sort of liked small talk. I said, well, how was business today? Oh, well, I don't know, not so good. Only took in $14 today. Oh, well, it'll be better tomorrow. You know, what do you think about the weather? Well, they say it's going to be a hard winter, and on and on. Little stuff like that. And in these small exchanges, people come out to greet us, and I go out to them. You see, you don't have to talk about politics, please, or anything over our heads. We can just go out and talk about almost nothing as long as our heart's in it, don't you think? That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. Wow, how wonderful. Well, I think we're ready to gather up some questions from you all. If you want to write down a question or two, we're going to collect your index cards, if you have one. 
Uh, let the ushers know by raising your hand so they can find you. And we will bring these questions back to Jan. Just keep those, keep those cards up until they're found. Okay. Bill, thank you for coming and grabbing them. I see I, I will a few. help you, some of you who wonder if I'm Cynthia, and tell you that I'm not. Oh. Cynthia has better legs. Cynthia has better legs. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Bill, I see one over here, dear. There you go. Before I finish the series, a lot of people would ask, are you going to let Father Tim die? And I'd say, would I kill the goose that laid the golden egg? <laughs> He's going to live a long and happy life. There you go, dear. While <clears throat> Thank you. Have Thank a moment. You. All right, so let's collect these good questions and... Thanks, Meg. All right, we'll keep them coming, but here's a first. Jan, is Father Tim Cavanaugh a real person or your actual husband? He seems so real, I can't imagine him not being a real person. Well, that's a great compliment in that question, I'll have to say. Thank you for that question. He's not a real person. He's real to me, and I'm obviously real to whoever wrote that question. But no, uh, like all of my characters, he was assembled from many parts and experiences and aspirations of my own. Um, I, I need to revise that I've never modeled a character on a real person. I did model one character on a house painter I had in Blowing Rock, Harley Welch, the old liquor runner that came to live with Father Tim and Cynthia for a while, now lives at Metagate with uh, Dooley and Lace. This painter was so hilariously funny, Irish, about this big around. Hmm. He said, Lord, when I was coming up, I was so poor. We didn't have nothing to play with. We didn't have nothing. He said, I went to school one day wearing one shoe. Teacher says, Harley, have you, have you lost a shoe? He says, oh, no, I found one. <laughs> so, you know, the house painter would just entertain me no end with stories like this. Oh, so he did become Harley Welch. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Here's another good question. When you sat down to write the first book, did you mean to write a series? I did not. Hmm. I did not. In fact, at the time I began my series, the series was a very unfashionable thing to write. You didn't want to admit to anybody that you were writing a series. Now look at the series. It's the thing to do. Hmm. Uh, but after I wrote the first novel, I thought, well, you know, maybe there could be another one. We've got him flying off to England, and he could come home again, and there's that woman who could move in next door. So I wrote a second. I said, you know, this needs to be a trilogy. So it was going to be a trilogy. And I took that idea to my publisher, and they said, well, how about five? Let's just, let's just do a five-book contract. Well, I've been poor for so long, believe me, that I was glad to have a five-book contract. I didn't stop to think about what enormous stress that was going to create. And then after five, people wanted more, and I said, okay. You know, by the way, Agatha Christie wrote something like 60 books and short stories about what is that little man's name? Hercule uh, Poirot. And at the end of it all, she wanted to quit writing about him because at the end of it all, she said, I never really cared for that little man. <laughs> <laughs> but I like Father Tim, and uh, I've, I've enjoyed his company. I can trust him. Mm. He's, uh, he, can, he can be witty. Uh, I'm not witty. Maybe I can be funny if I sit down and try, but he's, he's witty. Uh, like my mother was witty, and uh, Donna and uh, Emmy are witty. <laughs> um, anyway, I said, Mother, I do wish I had your wit. All I can be is funny sometimes. She says, well, honey, that's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. What kind of advice would you give to an aspiring writer, landscape architect, wife and mother by day, writer by night, who has finally finished her first draft of a novel? Mm -hmm. 
my very best advice, and I promise you this is true, just sit down first thing and do it. You say, yeah, but what am I going to say? I don't know. You sit down and you just say something. But you just need to start. You just need to get that blood flowing through your veins. And you can type crazy stuff if you want to. But it will eventually, then you, then you start losing your fear. You see what I'm saying? Because you're going to sit down, you're going to be afraid mm -hmm. that you're not going to write that great opening line that people will remember for two centuries. Just sit down and go. You'll be glad you did. Wonderful. And believe in yourself. Trust yourself. You've got your first draft. Hey, celebrate that. Don't think, oh boy, I don't know if I'll ever get that second draft done. Just celebrate the first draft. So do you know how your books are going to end when you start them? Sometimes, not, not often. Um, this last book, To Be Where You Are, I wrote the ending before I wrote any of the book. I just oh. knew that was where we were going. Hmm. And now you just, so you put the end over here and then you start writing toward the end. Oh, wow. Boom. Hmm. This person asks, why Ireland? Why what? Why Ireland? Why did I write about Ireland? Because Father Tim is Irish. Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh. He had always wanted to know more about his family history, his, his ancient family history. We took him back to Holly Springs to find out about his, his mom and dad and that relationship. Um, but he wanted to know who were the Kavanaugh's anyway, and uh, what did they bring to the party? Well, he got over there, and of course, he never got to go find out any of that because he got so enmeshed in the lives of all those people in that fishing lodge, which was interesting to me, actually. I didn't know that was going to happen. I thought, oh boy, we'll get to go all over Ireland and find out about the Kavanaugh's. Just stuck in that fishing lodge. Hmm. <laughs> what are your next creative goals or desires? I desire to write a an historical novel set during Jefferson's time because I'm in the place to do it. I'm within practically walking distance of UVA and their wonderful library. Uh, Monticello and its wonderful scholars library is just a short drive away. There's the wonderful library of Virginia. I have all, I have everything at my beck and paw. But I'm 81, I just had a birthday on the 14th. And I think that may be beyond my ambitions because that would take probably two years of research and then easily two years to write. And then, so what I've decided is that I would like to write some short stories. I've had short stories queuing up at my door for years. Hmm. I've begun some, I've fleshed some out, but I've never finished one. So maybe that's what I'll do. Oh, that sounds wonderful. What author influenced you the most? Well, honestly, I'll have to tell you some of the books that in, I can't remember all the names right now, but Heidi was very influential. Who's a Heidi fan? Oh, wasn't that <laughs> wonderful? living up there with her grandpa up in the Alps and all those goats and meeting Peter and eating cheese and drinking that milk. and <laughs> I mean, it was all just glorious to me. I just felt like Heidi was one of my friends. Uncle Remus was a seriously influential book in my life, and here's why. Although it's banned, I think it's still banned today, which is a blasphemy. Uncle Remus is a Christ figure. He loved unconditionally. He loved that little boy unconditionally. He served others unconditionally. I loved Uncle Remus. And if, as some of you have noticed, I write with a lot of dialect. I love the way people talk. I love to hear you talk. I'm just going to wait for you to open your mouth so I can hear you talk. Because <laughs> it's going to be different. It's going to be individual. Tennessee is an especially interesting kind of speech. It's 
Somebody said to me today, now talk slowly. This microphone system needs you to talk slowly. Of course, that won't be any problem for you. You're from North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sounds great. Here's a good one. What prompted the scripture inclusions, and how do you choose the scripture that I use? Well, I just try to feel out the situation and the circumstances. I often just pray that God will show me how to find my way around in the scripture to, to get what I need to flesh out this particular scene or incident in a character's life. Sometimes I will call a priest. I have called Bishop Cervini for um, to somewhere safe with somebody good. I spoke with him at great length about a number of issues, including scripture, and he was very, very helpful. Um, so it's just a little bit of everything. That's good. What are you reading right now? Mm, what am I reading right now? Isn't that funny? This is a question that I always go, duh. <laughs> I just read a lot of, I've been in Boca Grande for several weeks, and I read a lot there. I really enjoyed the, the time to just sit mm -hmm. and read. Mm -hmm. And I, oh, I know, a land remembered. Yes, old Florida, the history of old Florida, and how all, you know, the cattle were wild because they'd come in with the Spanish. So here are all these cattle that populated all over this huge expanse of land. And then somebody says, aha, uh -huh, we can start roping cattle. We can start getting a herd together. We can march this herd up to the market. We can sell this herd, and we're going to make some money. And so that's how Florida sort of launched. And then, of course, there's the citrus story, too. Hmm. But Florida, I, I've sort of fallen in love with Florida through that book. I highly recommend A Land Remembered. Mm, that sounds wonderful. I'd love to read that. Here's a great one. Cassandra King states, every author needs a space to write. Please describe yours. Well, um, I actually, for some quirky reason, put my desk right in the middle of everything. I mean, I'm there to answer the front door, pick up the mail, hear the phone ring. I mean, why didn't I just go upstairs and burrow in somewhere? Mm. I don't know, but it works. It's, I just like being right out there in the middle of everything, the vacuum cleaner, all the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you like a little din of background noise and activity. Well, just a little something doesn't mm. really bother me. That's uh -huh. great. <laughs> oh. Tell us about, there's a good question here about Jack. Where did Jack come from? And how disciplined do you have to be to write? Those are two very different questions, but where did Jack come from? Well, um, after I finished Somewhere Safe with Somebody Good, I knew obviously they were going to get married and they did get married and come rain or come shine. And Lace had been told early on that she could not have children. And there was such a tragic reason for the fact that she couldn't have children. And so I was resigned to that. And then I read up more on the medical research behind that particular condition. And I read that, yes, indeed, you can become pregnant. It's rare, but you can become pregnant. And I thought, well, this is fiction. You know, it's rare. It's okay. I'm going to let her have a child. <laughs> and I thought, but that's so expected. So then I thought, adoption. I'd never really paid much attention to how that works, but I became so engrossed in that. When I adopted Jack into the novel, honestly, I adopted that child into my own heart. Mm. I love that little kid. Um, and then, how many of you have read the last book? I don't want to do a spoiler here. I'm in the midst okay, of it. Okay, I won't tell you. I won't tell you what happens, but I think you'll like it. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
How disciplined do you have to be to write? Very, very disciplined. It is a completely, um, uh, it, it's a profession of solitude. My friend Donna cannot paint unless she's up in her, she's got a closet that she's converted into an art studio and she can paint some big pictures too. She's in there just going. But you can't do that in the kitchen. You know, you just can't because she's got three or four dogs too. <laughs> so you just have to find a place to protect what you're trying to create because what you're creating is very fragile. It's something very tender and very fragile. Um, yes, you've got to have a space for it and you've got to be willing to be secluded. My friends in Charlottesville say, well, she's gone to ground. That means that they're not going to see me for a while. Hmm. And that's the only way I can get it done. Wow. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Okay. Right. And now so. Jan would like to greet you all, and we're going to lead her down and bring her fans to her. And we've got a little stool in case, Jan, you need to take a And I think I can give you... And you can turn that off. Yeah. Do we have anyone who has any mobility issues that wants to come up first? We're certainly willing to start with those who have trouble walking or who need some extra help. Kay, do you want to come forward, honey? Do you want to meet her? 